1972, French geologist Michel Siffre lived in a cave in Texas for six months. The experiment was part of a NASA project to study the effects of prolonged isolation on the body and brain of future interplanetary missions. Sifu was housed in a cave deep underground, where he was supplied with water and food, and where equipment was installed to record his sleep patterns. As part of the experiment, the light and temperature in the cave did not change in any way over time. Siffer had no watch. There was no way he could tell what time it was, how much time had passed, or even whether it was day or night. He lived in a free rhythm. That is, he was awake and asleep when he wanted, turning the lights in the cave on and off at will. People don't tolerate experiments like this very well. Sefer suffered from bouts of depression and memory lapses, and even thought about leaving our mortal world. But what's most interesting is what happened to his perception of time. In the first few days, his day stretched to 25, 26 hours. However, this was only the beginning. Gradually, Sifir's subjective day when he was awake reached 32 hours, and the night when he slept 16 hours. Thus, sometimes his 24-hour day reached 48 hours, twice the norm. On day 179, Sifir was told that the experiment was over, and he was very surprised because he thought he had been in the cave for only 151 days. So his internal sense of time had slowed down compared to the real time, so much so that he was 28 days wrong. And that's odd. It would be one thing if he was spending his time happily, but it's another to underestimate the passing hours when you're going crazy alone in a cave. However, this form of subjective time stretching has been observed in other similar cases of human isolation, sometimes in an even stronger form. In 1988, Véronique Leguine lived in a cave in France for 111 days, and when she came to the surface, she thought only 42 days had passed. In 1989, Italian interior designer Stefania Fellini spent four months in a cave at great depths, but she herself believed she had only been underground for two months. In 1993, the Italian sociologist lived in an underground cave for a year, and when he came to the surface, as he thought it was summer, he found out that it was already winter on the calendar. These cases clearly demonstrate that our subjective perception of time is not objective. You might say that, like any subjective experience. Subjective time is a generation of brain activity and does not exist outside the human skull. Just as, for example, no color exists in nature. Color is just the brain's interpretation of a narrow spectrum of electromagnetic waves. There is as much in common between them as there is between the letters of the alphabet and the sounds we assign to them. And, of course, like most subjective sensations, the sense of time is subject to illusion and distortion. Indeed, when we look around us, we see some brain-created holistic picture of the world. However, when it comes to a subjective phenomenon, such as the same color, we know that color has a physical equivalent, and this equivalent is the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation. That is, the brain, even subjectively, but interprets some objective, really existing in nature phenomena. But what does the brain interpret when we talk about the feeling of the flow of time? What, in reality, does this feeling have an equivalent? If you think this is a silly question, the answer to which is obvious, then you don't know even a little what science knows about time to date. Because what you are experiencing right now, the sensation of the present moment, is one of the great unsolved scientific mysteries. But let's take our time and let's leave our subjective experience for now. What is time objective anyway? There are big problems with that too. Even Aurelius Augustan, philosopher and theologian more than 1500 years ago, wrote, If no one asks me about it, I know what time is. If I wanted to explain it to the person who asked me, no, I don't know. And the physicist Richard Feynman said, it would be nice if we could accept the fact that time is one of those things we probably can't define. What really matters is not how we define time, but how we measure it. So the definition literally sounds like time is what the clock says it is. But if one still tries to answer this question in a detailed way, most would intuitively conclude that time is a sequence of events flowing from the past to the future through the present. At the same time, only the present moment is real, because every moment that goes into the past immediately disappears. The future has yet to happen and does not yet exist. And in general, the past future is just our abstractions. But modern physics explicitly hints that, in reality, the real picture of the world does not resemble this description at all. Whatever time is, our intuitive understanding of it just doesn't fit anywhere. Let's take a look at a thought experiment that everyone has heard about in one form or another so many times that we've simply stopped paying attention to it, and certainly not even trying to think about how paradoxical conclusions about the surrounding reality can follow from it. 
I'll describe it quickly. Imagine a strange train with one single carriage 400,000 kilometers long, moving in a straight line at a speed of 200,000 kilometers per second. There's a man standing exactly in the middle of it. He has a gun in each hand. One gun pointed at the window at the beginning of the carriage, the other at the window at the end. And these guns are so powerful that the speed of a bullet fired from them is 200,000 kilometers per second. When the man in the train car fires in exactly one second, both panes of glass will shatter and it will happen at the same time. It's kind of obvious. However, if at the moment of the shot, the person in the carriage were to line up with the person on the stationary platform, the person on the platform would see things differently. The bullet sent backwards would have shattered the glass in a second as well, relative to the train. Its velocity would be 200,000 kilometers per second against the platform, zero kilometers per second. And all of this is absolutely correct. But here is a bullet fired forward relative to the train car, moving at 200,000 kilometers per second and relative to the platform already 400,000 kilometers per second. And this is the speed it should have from the point of view of the person on the platform so that it could reach the front window in a second. But we know that 400,000 kilometers per second is an impossible speed. It is 100,000 kilometers per second higher than the speed of light. So the time of the bullet, because of the effects of the special theory of relativity, will slow down. And according to the calculations, from the point of view of the person on the platform, in fact, its speed, instead of 400,000, will be only 270, 7,000 kilometers per second. And therefore, from his own point of view, it will not be able to fly to the front window in one second. So, from the point of view of the man on the platform, the windows won't break at the same time. The rear window will break first, and then the front window will break later. And it's not a matter of a trick of the eye. It's an objective fact. The special theory of relativity has been verified in so many ways and with such precision that we can say unequivocally, if we do the above experiment for real, everything will be just so. This phenomenon is called relativity of simultaneity, and it tells us something incomprehensible about the world we live in. It's as if we have two different realities, in one of which both windows are either simultaneously whole or simultaneously broken, but in the other reality, there is a moment when the back window is already broken and the front window is not yet. These are not two different universes. Both people are in the same universe, because if they talk to each other, they will disagree as to when the windows broke. So, whose reality is real? As strange as it may seem, the special theory of relativity tells us that both realities are absolutely equal. If you've watched videos describing such mental experiments, this is usually the point where everyone usually just stops and goes no further. But what should a universe in which such thing is possible look like? After all, contradictory statements cannot be true at the same time. That would violate the laws of logic. The world doesn't have to be logical but we have to at least try to make sense of the reality we're in. Well, there have been attempts. They're over a hundred years old. The model of the universe that I will describe today has nothing to do with our everyday intuition. But exactly this model is accepted and considered as corresponding to reality by a great number of physicists and philosophers, because it is the model that the laws of physics point to in every possible way. Frankly speaking, it is not very happy, because as you will see, the, the picture is not very pleasant and encouraging, and the most complex of all known mechanisms in the universe, which is in our skull, has not evolved to understand the nature of time. But that contradictory picture of the universe that you will discover has probably put some imprint on the very design of the human brain. The video is inspired by American neuroscientist Dean Bonomano's book, Your Brain is a Time Machine. Bonomano is one of the first neuroscientists to devote a significant part of his scientific career to the question of how the human brain encodes time. The author is a neuroscientist, but he studied the work of various scientists while writing the book. And in addition, the acknowledgments include a whole list of physicists and philosophers who generously advised him. And this is a unique story. Science always tries to separate the experiment from the experimenter to maximize objectivity. But here, the author is trying to do the opposite. And he fails at it, because what seems familiar and natural to us is disastrously different from what the equations say. For over a hundred years, scientists have been trying to find something in the physical world that could be called the passage of time. So far, to no avail. And so Bonomano, like many before him, concludes that human perception of the passage of time is nothing but an illusion. Explaining his theory of relativity, Einstein said, when you sit next to a pretty girl, two hours seems like a minute. And when you sit on a hot stove, a minute seems like two hours. That's what relativity is. 
First, we should discuss with you what time means to us, humans, so that we can, on the one hand, get a much better feel for all the craziness of the second half of the video, and on the other hand, realize that maybe it's not all that crazy after all. Let's start with the fact that, despite the timing errors that have happened to people in isolation, this is an unnatural situation for the human body. You've heard that we have an internal clock. You know, roughly when a traffic light turns green or when a TV commercial ends. But have you ever thought about what that clock looks like and where it is located? So, from Dean Bonomano's perspective, temporal processing is so important to brain function that the mechanisms for determining time are built into the brain's operating systems at the most basic level, at the level of neurons, synapses, and networks. There's no point in looking for which part of the brain determines time, because most neural networks do it. If one were to put in a nutshell the essence of brain function, the best definition would probably be anticipating the future. Dean Bonomano. Let's start by saying that the brain is, in the broadest sense, a time machine. Not in the sense of time travel, but in the sense of working with time. For hundreds of millions of years, animals on the planet have competed to evolve and be able to predict the future. Predators have learned to anticipate the behavior of their victims, and victims have learned to anticipate the behavior of predators, and they all try to anticipate the behavior of potential sexual partners. Some prepare for the future by stockpiling food, building nests and canning jars of jam. Life on Earth anticipates sunset and sunrise, winter and spring. All those who failed to deal with it did not survive or leave offspring. Whether you realize it or not, at every moment in time, your brain automatically tries to predict what is about to happen. These short-term predictions for about the next few seconds are made completely automatically and unconsciously. If a rubber ball rolls off the table, we automatically make a motion to catch it when it bounces off the floor. But we react very differently if a piece of pie falls off the table. Dean Bonomano Humans and other animals are constantly trying to make predictions for all sorts of time periods. Bring a cat into a new home and watch him tensely construct a map of the area in his head, sniffing every corner. This is his way of preparing himself for what might happen not only in a few seconds, but in a few minutes or even hours. When the wolf stops to pick up on any sounds or smells, he's looking for clues that will help him locate potential enemies, victims, or a partner. When a dog jumps up to grab a frisbee, it needs to know where the plastic disc will end up a second later, and that requires the ability to predict. Birds are pollinators able to measure the amount of time that has elapsed since their last visit to a particular flower, so that the flower will be filled with nectar again in time for the next time. Literally all manifestations of life, from the ability to hit a moving target with a spear, to knowing when to laugh at the end of a joke, or play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, to being able to regulate the daily cycle of sleep and wakefulness, or the monthly menstrual cycle, all require the ability to tell time. The brain doesn't just count down the seconds, hours and days of our lives, but recognizes and creates temporal images such as musical rhythms and precise sequences of movement that allow gymnasts to perform acrobatic stunts. Our natural inclination to clap our hands, snap our fingers, or bob our heads to the beat of music suggests that the human brain is busy predicting all the time. Your brain is looking a few hundred seconds ahead, predicting the next beat and synchronizing your actions with it. If you want to understand this, try breaking the rhythm of the music and, for example, snapping your fingers out of tune. You will have to concentrate all your attention to do this, while almost no concentration is needed to keep the rhythm of the music. Perhaps man is the only one, and if not, then certainly one of the few creatures on the planet that can make mental time travel. Well, most importantly, the brain literally creates a sense of time, a sense of continuity of the present moment. You can easily verify this. Conduct an experiment. First, ask someone to stand across from you and start looking alternately at your left and right eye. You will notice that the person's eyes are moving, and this movement takes some time. After that, go to the mirror and try to do the same with yourself. Looking at your left and right eyes, you will find that your reflection does not move your eyes, not even trying, and all because the brain simply cuts out this moment and all the moments that occur when you move your eyes from one object to another, and we don't even notice it. To us, the picture appears to be continuous. The same thing happens when we blink. The brain erases the frames before and after the eyelids close. You'll say it's a small thing, but for example, at 100 kilometers per hour during the blink, the car travels about five meters. Five meters that simply don't exist for you. That's why it's so dangerous to race in the city. 
Formula One racers, where speeds exceed 350 kilometers per hour, are accustomed to blinking only on certain parts of the track. In total, we have about an hour of cut material disappearing in a day. So the sense of a continuously evolving reality is a credit to the brain. But the only thing we live directly is the present moment. And in reality, we cannot be in any other moment than the now. And at the same time, when we try to capture that very now, it immediately slips away. But not everyone does. There is one person with a rare specific brain damage that caused his present moment to stop about 40 years ago. We're talking about British music critic Clive Waring, who, after a severe infectious disease and damage to his hippocampus, his brain completely lost the ability to create lasting new long-term memories. And it's one of the most severe cases of amnesia in the world. His memory of events lasts between seven and 30 seconds. His entire life consists of the fact that on average, every 20 seconds, it's as if he's waking up every 20 seconds, restarting his consciousness as his short-term memory expires. And every time for almost 40 years now, he feels like he's only recently come out of a coma. If he is engaged in a conversation, he is able to provide answers to questions, but he cannot stay in the context of the conversation for longer than a few sentences. He was advised to keep a personal diary, which he did. But if we look inside, we see a horror-inducing picture. Page after page of entries look like this. 8, 31 a.m. Now I'm really fully awake. Then he crosses out this line and writes, 9, 6 a.m. Now I am completely, absolutely awake for the first time. Ignore the last entry. It's crossed out again. 9, 34 a.m. Now I am in the highest degree truly awake for the first time. As we examine his diaries, we will see that at one point, he begins to write time in large numbers and does so with such pressure as if he is trying to mark himself in a continuum to get on the time train. Isn't this the little death he's so desperately trying to fight? The inscription in huge letters, I am alive. And each time he didn't know how or by whom the previous entries were made, though he recognized his own handwriting. Since he can't figure out where he is or how he got here, the only possible interpretation for his brain is that he just woke up. An endless loop of one single moment. And if you're wondering how that might feel, in a documentary broadcast in 2005, Waring answers questions like this. You are the first people I saw. You three, two men and one lady. The first people I've seen since I got sick. No difference between day and night. No thoughts at all, no dreams. Day and night are the same. Empty, just like death. Clive, tell me, is it very hard? No, it's one and the same as being dead, which isn't hard at all, is it? Being dead is easy. You don't do anything at all. You can't do anything when you're dead. It was the same thing, exactly. Do you miss your old life? Yes, but I never realized I was thinking about it. That's why I was never bored or sad. I've never been anything at all. It's just like death. There aren't even dreams. It's the same thing, day and night. This tragic story, though it doesn't prove it, does suggest that perhaps for humans, the moment we call now is linked to short-term memory. And it does not happen at once, but as if in jerks, having some duration in time. That is, the conscious feeling of the present can rather be compared to a note than to a frozen movie frame. Neuropsychologist, linguist, and professor emeritus of psychology at Harvard University, Steven Pinker, has observed, matter is distributed in space, but consciousness exists in time. And this is as obvious as the fact that I think implies I exist. However, the question then arises, how densely is consciousness distributed in time in the sense of how brief a moment can we grasp? And here, I will immediately disclaim that I am not encouraging anyone to use the substance I'm going to talk about next. Remember that depending on where you live, you may be legally liable for some manipulation of it. Our sense of time changes a lot under the influence of psychoactive drugs. William James, one of the creators of modern psychology, wrote, when intoxicated with there is a curious sensation of stretching time. We begin to speak a phrase, but when we reach the end, it seems as if we began speaking an eternity ago. The active ingredient tetrahydrocannabinol, according to experimental data, cause a sense of slowing down or stopping external time. In one of the first studies, for example, people were asked to simply report when 60 seconds had elapsed after a signal, while their estimates were close to 60 seconds in their normal state. After oral administration, people estimated time differently. After about 42 seconds, they believed that a minute had already passed. But ingesting substances is not the only way that people experience a slowing down of the flow of time. We have heard about it many times. 
and someone has even experienced this effect in a strong emotional shock and in a life-threatening situation. The reasons for this distortion of time are still not fully understood. There are different hypotheses, and in the book, the author proposes three. The first is the overclocking of the brain by analogy with the overclocking of the processor. Boyomano says that in theory, with the help of some mechanisms, the brain can briefly increase its efficiency by 10, 20 percent. The second hypothesis is hypermemory. Its essence is that people perceive what is happening in slow motion, not at the moment of the event, but afterward, returning to this event in memory. In other words, in this state, the speed of perception of events is more or less normal, but the series of memories may be more detailed than normal. Therefore, in retrospect, it seems that everything happened in slow motion. The question is how much we can trust such memories. It is well known that victims of serious crimes, for example, are often mistaken when identifying a suspect. Of course, the hypermemory hypothesis cannot explain why people acted faster and more clearly than usual in an extreme situation, nor can it explain such a widespread judgment that the effect of time dilation is observed precisely at the moment of danger. The author of the book unwittingly happened to test this hypothesis on himself. He writes, During an automobile accident, my car was hit from the side, overturned and flew into a telephone pole. And I remember very well that all of this was really happening very slowly. At that moment, I thought, wow, time is really slowing down. But in confirmation of the fact that in such moments we perceive the situation in a less than adequate way, I have to say that I don't remember acting in any particularly fast or clear way. And I don't even remember the side airbags deploying. But since I thought of time slowing down, it means that it was at the time of the accident that I perceived events in slow motion. Hence, the hypermemory hypothesis cannot fully explain the time dilation effect. So he proposes a third and most interesting hypothesis called meta-illusion. Now I'm going to ask you to do a strange thing. Touch your hand to some object, a wall, desk, or a telephone, and observe how it feels. Doesn't it seem strange to you that, although the formation of the sensation of the object takes place in the brain, we feel it in our head? The sensation is literally transported to a specific point in space. Bonomano writes, one of the most profound subjective human sensations is that your fingers, your hands, your feet, your whole body belongs to you, and it's all one big illusion. You have probably heard there is such a syndrome phantom limbs. If not, the essence of it is that some people after amputation of a hand or leg continue to feel it as clearly as most of us feel the real one. This phenomenon suggests that the brain works so hard to give us the feeling of possessing the bones, muscles, and nerves that make up our limbs that it continues to maintain this illusion, despite the disappearance of those very limbs. Thus, we can conclude that the illusion is not the phantom limb, but the feeling of possessing real limbs. In reality, things are even more interesting. If you hit your finger with a hammer, your brain will project the sensation of pain into a specific area of space, your finger. But if you put an artificial hand next to your hand, the brain can change the perception so that you feel your hand where the artificial hand is. It's as if the brain agrees to think of the artificial hand as your hand. This is the so-called rubber hand illusion. So, based on this example, Bonomano suggests that if our brain builds such persistent spatial mirages, why doesn't it also build temporal mirages? You will learn today that what we call the passage of time may be an illusion. And so the name of the hypothesis, meta-illusion, implies that time dilation is an illusion of an illusion. On YouTube, in the player settings, you have the option to choose how fast the video plays. You can speed up or slow down the video by half and still absorb the information well. Dean Bonamano writes that our normal sense of time is a mental construct that can have different speed settings. You can see this for yourself by watching some video at double speed for five minutes and then turning on normal speed and being surprised at how slow the normal passage of time seems. In some simulation, you would very quickly get used to living in an accelerated world and would soon come to accept just such a passage of time as normal. This is why the author of the book says that the speed of our perception of time is not a static illusion. In fact, we are constantly using our ability to compress and stretch time. It has been proven that the brain can reproduce actions at a faster rate than in reality. For example, you can speak any phrase in your mind much faster than with your lips and tongue. Same with tying your shoelaces, getting up from the couch, and anything else. So, on the subject of time, distortion, and life-threatening situations, there are several examples in the book. 
Here's what a 24-year-old car racer who was involved in an accident at 250 kilometers per hour that caused his car to flip several times in midair, coming off the ground 10 meters high. It seemed like it took forever. Everything was happening very slowly, and I felt like I was acting on stage, but could see from the outside as I flipped the car over and over again. It was like I was watching the whole thing from the auditorium. And here's what a 21-year-old university student who was involved in a serious car accident reported. At that moment, time kind of stopped. Everything seemed to last forever. Space also became unnatural. It was like sitting in an auditorium, watching a movie. And finally, the memories of a soldier whose car was blown up by a landmine. I didn't feel that time was passing. Nothing was changing. There was something wrong with space, too. And I seemed to exist only in thought. As we can see, not only the perception of time, but also the perception of space changes in critical situations. Many people in such moments observe what is happening as if from the outside, Bonamano writes. In any other context, the above statements would appear to be hallucinations or a disturbance of consciousness, perhaps the sudden flood of endogenous neuroactive substances released during the fight or flight response overloaded the brain's neural network and caused the hallucinations. So perhaps the time dilation effect is more properly understood as another variant of a disturbance of consciousness that has little to do with reality. But he goes on to emphasize that the three hypotheses listed are not mutually exclusive. In general, it's a very strange thing, the perception of time. We can overestimate the amount of time we spend in queues or waiting for an answer on the phone. That is, every minute lasts as long as two minutes. But on the other hand, studies show that when you listen to music, the waiting time will be shorter. Companies take advantage of this, and that's why you hear music when, for example, you're waiting for an operator to respond. So, people can slow down or even speed up their experience of time to a certain extent. But what scaling opportunities will we have if we talk about time not as something we perceive, but as a physical process? If we start dividing time into ever smaller and smaller intervals, will we ever stumble upon some fundamental unit of time that can no longer be divided into an even shorter unit? Hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds are all wrong. How about the nanosecond or femtosecond? In some physics models, the smallest discrete indecomposable unit of time is called chronon. The clock is the most accurate instrument we have ever built. Man has become somewhat even obsessed in his quest to learn how to tell time. Centuries ago, clocks rarely agreed with each other. It follows from Einstein's general theory of relativity that time determined by any clock is affected by the forces of gravity. Therefore, the same atomic clock will tick faster on a space satellite than on Earth. But think about it. The readings of two atomic clocks will diverge if one is placed on the floor and the other on a table. Richard Feynman once said that, because of the effects of relativity, because of time dilation, the core of the Earth should be noticeably younger than its crust. He suggested a difference of a few days, but recent calculations have shown that over the entire lifetime of the Earth, there is a difference of about 2.5 years between the core and the crust. So from the perspective of us, humans living in 2024, the core is still in 2021. At the moment, we have learned to measure time more accurately than any other parameters, and many of the values are defined through it. So, for example, the definition of a meter literally sounds like the distance that light travels in 1 ,000 ,000 fractions of a second. The progress of measurement is just crazy. But despite this, science still has no answer to the question of whether time is discrete or continuous. Many experts agree that the existence of discrete moments would lead to paradoxes. For example, Zeno's paradoxes of dichotomy, the modern formulation of which is to overcome the path, one must first overcome half of the path, and to overcome half of the path, one must first overcome half of the half, and so to infinity. Therefore, the movement will never begin. That is, it makes sense if we imagine that every action takes a certain number of moments to complete, and every moment takes time to complete. We might encounter an infinite chain of instants needed to complete an action, which means the passage of time can't even begin. This is part of the mystery of time, the essence of which we are slowly getting closer to. This is where the most unpleasant half of the video begins. We physicists believe that the division into past, present, and future is but a stable illusion. Albert Einstein You've probably heard many times that the laws of physics are symmetrical with respect to time, that they don't emphasize the direction of time or emphasize any particular moment. For them, past, present, and future are equivalent to each other. Thus, now on the time scale is the same as here in the realm of space. 
For this reason, many physicists and philosophers believe that any moments on the timeline are equally real. And the main reason for accepting this confusing concept is Einstein's theory of relativity. The train example from the beginning of the video demonstrates that each observer has his or her own independent concept of the present moment, depending on the speed and direction of travel. Everyone has their own set of simultaneous events that are not necessarily simultaneous for other observers. Like I said, those who talk about this usually stop here. The effect of the theory of relativity that the train example demonstrates is very interesting, but it is extremely detached from our reality. We don't encounter trains like this in our daily lives. So why should we care? How can it even affect our perceived picture of the world? To understand this, let's go a little further. In book about computers, thinking, and the laws of physics, Nobel Prize winning physicist Roger Penrose cites a thought experiment that simply forces you to rethink your own perceptions of reality. The fact is that even at very small relative velocities, changes in timeline become not only noticeable, but colossal if two points are at great distances from each other. For example, two people walking slowly past each other in the street will see no difference between the events happening around them. But if, at the moment, they are level with each other, transported to the Andromeda galaxy 2.5 million light years away, at the same time, and in the opinion of these two similar events, will actually be several days behind each other in time. While for one passerby, the space fleet sent on a mission to destroy all life on Earth is already in flight. For the other passerby, the very decision to send the space fleet on a raid has not yet been made. Roger Penrose. If this happens, it has a most dramatic effect on our understanding of time. I will remind you, the special theory of relativity has been verified with inconceivably high accuracy. There's an important caveat to be made here. No passerby can actually see or recognize what is happening in the Andromeda galaxy, because the light from Andromeda, like any information, will only reach Earth in 2.5 million years. The argument is not that, but that if we could make simultaneous three-dimensional casts of the universe of each of the two pedestrians, those casts would be almost indistinguishable at the point where the pedestrians met, but would begin to differ more and more as we move away from that point. And one more important clarification, it is not only about conscious observers. This situation concerns any material point. That is, it doesn't matter if it's people passing each other, rocks flying past each other, moving particles, or anything else. It all has its own system of account and its own set of simultaneous events. So, as you can see, the paradox that emerges is that two people who, from their conscious perspective, are in the same place and at the same moment, suddenly have different sets of events in their so-called present moment. Once again, these are not different universes in which different events are happening, because if the second pedestrian, who is moving away from Andromeda, turns around and follows the first pedestrian, his point of view of the events happening in space will become conditionally exactly the same as the first pedestrian's. Conditionally, because full synchronization is impossible, but not because the universes are different. If we look at the situation from the opposite side, it will turn out that from the point of view of aliens from the Andromeda galaxy, all the same things will happen to us from their point of view. For some of them, you exist in yesterday, and for some of them, in tomorrow. I'll ask the question again. What would a universe in which this is possible look like? The special theory of relativity tells us that there are an infinite number of simultaneity planes passing through any given point in space-time. And for each point in space, there are different or very different sets of simultaneous events. Different planes of simultaneity. So if you take us, even the slightest head movement changes the perceived present moment in the universe for you. Things get even more absurd when you realize that the present moment, spaces are different for your head, for your hands, for your feet and body. Is that what, based on this data, the universe looks like? If we were somehow able to fly outside the boundaries of space and turn around and look around from the perspective of the special theory of relativity, we would see an unchanging four-dimensional block in which time exists as another spatial coordinate. We would realize that within the framework of such a model, to speak about now is the same as to speak about here, because any present moment is real and exists on one of the sections of this block. The scientist, mathematician, and great-grandson of Hegel, Rudy Rucker, wrote, as it turns out, it is actually impossible to find any objective and universally acceptable definition of all space taken at a given moment. This follows from Einstein's special theory of relativity. Thus, the idea of a block universe is more than an attractive metaphysical theory. It is a well-established scientific fact. 
Interestingly, when Einstein first published his paper on the special theory of relativity, he did not argue that time should be considered as the fourth dimension of the Bloch universe. The first to draw these surprising conclusions regarding the relationship between space and time was his Zurich lecturer, Hermann Minkowski, who is said to have called Einstein a lazy dog when he was a student. It was Minkowski who brought Einstein's theory to geometric form. In 1908, building on his earlier work, Minkowski majestically reported, the views on space and time which I wish to convey to you have arisen on the soil of experimental physics, and that is their strength. They are radical. Henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to disappear, and only a kind of union of these two concepts will preserve an independent reality. Of course, we cannot visualize and depict a four-dimensional block, but for the sake of clear illustration, we can neglect one spatial dimension as shown here. And in this representation, it will now be even easier for us to understand what a simultaneity plane is. For this purpose, let us consider a more radical variant. Let's take an Earthling and an alien being from some galaxy at a distance of not 2.5 million, like Andromeda, but 10 billion light years. If the alien and the human are at rest relative to each other, their clocks run synchronously and the present moment for them lies on the same slice of the block of the universe. But if the alien starts to move away from the Earth, the clocks will become unsynchronized, because recall, time slows down for moving objects. So, the alien's plane of simultaneity with respect to the Earth will point toward the past. Let's assume that aliens in a distant galaxy are not moving much faster than humans, and thus the angle of inclination will be small, However, at a distance of 10 billion light years, this small angle will give a huge time difference. And from the alien's point of view, the present moment on Earth will be some moment from, it's hard to believe, the 19th century. And that moment, according to the special theory of relativity, will be as real as the moment you're in right now. By manipulating the alien speed, direction of travel, and distance from Earth, we can make any time from the year 1,000 or 3,000 real. This is one of the reasons why FL travel in space seems highly questionable. Because they would not only result in traveling in space, but also in time. But if you think that's it, that's just the beginning. The wave suggested to him that any shape in space is formed by the intersection of a shape with many dimensions. A square is the result of crossing a cube, and a circle is the result of crossing a sphere. The three-dimensional cube and sphere arise from the crossing of figures of four dimensions, which people have hitherto only guessed at and which they have occasionally seen in dreams. Howard Phillips, Lovecraft. If you used to think that time was like a river, the laws of physics say that this river is frozen. Common sense tells us that if we live in a block universe, if events in the past and events in the future are somehow fixed or even inevitable, then our inner sense of freedom of choice is a phantom. Any choice you have to make in life has already been made. On the other hand, the predetermination of life is not necessary. Against this background, it becomes amusing to learn that humans have apparently developed the ability to understand the concept of time using the same mechanisms that are designed to comprehend space. In other words, at the most basic level, the brain probably makes no distinction between space and time. And to get to the main mystery of this video and better understand it, we need to talk about it. Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget looked for parallels between psychology and physics. Piaget revolutionized the field of developmental psychology by explaining the mechanisms of children's cognition of, of abstract concepts such as quantity, space, and time. He believed there was a profound connection between children's innate concept of relativity of time and the relativity of time in Einstein's theory. To understand how time is reflected in children's minds, Piaget asked them to perform various simple tasks. In one such task, he used two snakes that crawled along parallel trajectories for a few seconds. For example, the blue and yellow snake started moving from the same starting position at the same moment in time and stopped at the same time. But the blue one moved farther because it was crawling faster. So the five to six-year-old children falsely reported that the snake that traveled a greater distance stopped later. So the parallel to the theory of relativity is this. Children intuitively understand that time is stretched out for an object moving at a greater speed. So it is as if we have an innate understanding of the concept of space-time. Certainly a strong statement. However, Einstein himself, referring to Piaget's ideas, said that this theory was so simple that only a genius could have come up with it. So, I suggest we look at how the brain works in this regard in adult humans. Imagine two light bulbs that light up one at a time for short periods of time, eight seconds apart. 
An early study found that when the bulbs were spaced 20, 40, and 80 centimeters apart, the average time between flashes was estimated to be 6.5, 7.15, and 8.5 seconds, respectively, whereas it was always 8 seconds. This is the so-called kappa effect. It has been demonstrated many times in many ways, and is that the distance between two events strongly influences people's perception of the time interval between them. It's as if the brain at a fundamental level links the concepts of space and time. After all, how do you visualize chronology? Here, put the years 2021, 2022, and 2023 in chronological order in your mind. You got it, okay? First of all, the brain does not try to do it otherwise than to take three numbers and arrange them in space, mental space. So it operates solely in spatial categories. In fact, it's hard to imagine how it could be done any other way, unless you mentally live those three years. But most importantly, I bet you put them from left to right. If not, you're in the minority. Chronology in our brains almost always looks like a horizontal arrow pointing from left to right, and it seems so natural. But why exactly is it that way? Because after all, the scale can be visualized any way you want. Since we use space to represent time, why not from right to left? Or better yet, from bottom to top? Isn't that more obvious? Isn't that more like moving forward in time? But no, that's how people most often envision it. There are many attempts to explain why the brain uses this particular spatial mental timeline, leading the timeline from left to right on a wide variety of occasions. Bonomano says it's about the way our brains are designed. For example, in an experiment where participants had to compare the duration of notes with some given standard and separate the sounds that were shorter from the sounds that were longer, an interesting pattern emerged. The efficiency of this task depended on the location of the buttons. People coped with the task faster and better if they could use the index finger of the left hand to indicate a short interval and the index finger of the right hand to indicate a long interval, but not vice versa. In other words, it is more natural for humans to respond to a short cue with their left hand and a long cue with their right hand. Bonomano writes, it is as if the mental timeline is directed from left to right in neuronal circuits. Further evidence for the existence of a mental timeline was discovered in the lab of cognitive psychologist Lyra Boroditskaya. Stroke survivors with lesions in the right parietal cortex often do not perceive objects to their left clearly enough. So-called left-sided ignoring of the half space. For example, such patients do not take food from the left side of the plate or even wash the left side of the face. Boroditskaya and her colleagues have shown that patients with left-sided hemispace neglect have difficulty placing information about the past and future on a mental timeline, resulting in an inability to recall the temporal context of events. Oh, and after all, you've noticed that when talking about time, we constantly resort to using adjectives and adverbs that refer to space. Looking ahead, looking back, winter is near, a short life, a long time, and so on. Metaphors from the field of space are often used to describe time and very rarely vice versa, except for the phrases, I live half an hour away from here. Nothing comes to mind. And this happens in every language in the world. Dean Bonamano writes, in general, we do not yet fully understand how the neurons of the hippocampus or some other area of the brain measure, reproduce, and store information about the magnitude of spatial and temporal parameters. But based on philological, psychophysical, and neurophysiological evidence, we can conclude that space and time are intertwined in our neuronal circuits. You will say that time cannot be a spatial coordinate because it is very different from spatial dimensions. For example, when we move, we literally see the geometry of space change. Let's say that, as we get closer to objects, they appear larger to us, and as we move away from them, they appear smaller. This doesn't happen with time travel, but it doesn't. At the moment of any movement, something unexpected happens. Objects start to shrink along the way. For example, if you have good eyesight, you may have repeatedly noticed that when you are driving at 60 kilometers per hour, a car five meters long, Standing in front of you at the curb will, from your point of view, stop about eight quadrillionths of a meter shorter and closer to you. The name of this phenomenon is Lorentzian length contraction. Extreme manifestations of the special theory of relativity are very far removed from our everyday experience. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in 2012, even developed a game that shows how the first-person world would be perceived if the speed of light equaled the speed of walking. The game takes into account all the effects of the special theory of relativity. I'll leave a link below the video. The game is free, but only runs on a comp. Just look, the slower you move in time, changing your position on the time axis, 
the more the geometry of space and objects in it changes. Some of the effects are optical, but the contraction of length and space is not. So even in this respect, time has observable spatial properties. And now that we have discussed the concept of time from the side of our personal perception and from the side of physics, let us combine these two views and get a complete picture of nature. But that's exactly what's impossible. And therein lies one of the basic mysteries of the universe, of all the obstacles to a deep comprehension of life. No problem is as formidable as the problem of time. How to explain time? None, unless you explain life. How to explain life? None, if you don't explain time. Uncovering the deep and hidden connection between time and life is a matter for the future. John Wheeler. Life in general, and man in particular, can move along spatial axes in both directions. That is, you can go forward, backward, left, right, up, down. But moving along the temporal axis is always in one direction, only. At least people know this from their conscious experience. We can adjust the speed of movement in time, but not the direction. For us, time always moves only forward and never backward. While the fundamental laws of physics say nothing about why we think time moves forward. Despite all these compelling arguments for the fact that we live in a block universe, we have to admit that the laws of physics cannot explain the most obvious human observation, which is that the present moment is different from all other moments, and that time is passing. Einstein himself held to the concept of a block universe, and he, apparently, also did not give rest to such an inconsistency between our sensations and the modern understanding of the laws of physics. Recounting a conversation with Einstein, philosopher Rudolf Carnap wrote the following. One day Einstein declared that the problem of the present seriously troubled him. He explained that the experience of the present meant something special for man, something fundamentally different from the past and the future, but that this important difference did not and could not belong to the realm of physics. That this experience could not be explained by science seemed to him an occasion for a painful but inevitable retreat. And here's what Roger Penrose says after describing the Andromeda mental experiment we discussed today. Before we depart, it makes sense to dwell a bit on another puzzling discrepancy between our subjective perception of time and the concepts of modern physics. The fact is that, according to the special theory of relativity, there really is no such thing as now at all. From what we have in this theory, the best approximation to it would be the space of simultaneous events of an observer in space-time. This analogy comes to mind. It is as if the universe with all its events were a vinyl record and our consciousness a turntable needle. But this analogy is absurd because consciousness is part of the universe. And in this analogy, it should be part of the record, not something outside of it. The inability to reconcile the idea of a block universe with the sense of the passage of time is such a profound problem that many physicists and philosophers believe the only way to solve it is to recognize the sense of the passage of time as an illusion. But what can it even mean? And how can it be illusory? In my opinion, the biggest problem lies in the glaring discrepancy between physical time and subjective, psychological time. The apparent sense of movement or flow of time, perhaps acquired through backdoor thinking, is a profound mystery. Is it related to quantum processes in the brain? Does it reflect an objective property of time in our real world of material objects? that we simply cannot detect? Or will the passage of time ultimately prove to be purely a mental construct, an illusion or error of consciousness? Paul Davies, theoretical physicist, cosmologist. So the sense of the passage of time is really a mental construct at the very least, because we perceive the world around us and inside our heads. The same mental construct, as we said at the beginning, is vision and also sounds and smells. These are illusions in the sense that they don't exist in the external world, but they make adaptive sense because they correlate with real physical phenomena, electromagnetic wavelengths, and a specific set of sound waves or chemical structure of molecules. That is, there is no color blue in the objective world. Blue is an illusion caused by electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength of 470 nanometers. There are no unpleasant odors in the objective world, but there are, for example, sulfur molecules that the brain interprets as the smell of rotten food. So you see, any such illusion has an adaptive meaning because it strictly correlates with something that actually exists. But then, where does the sense of time come from? Which, as we see, literally has no equivalent in the physical world. So it's not just in some sense an illusion. It is an illusion in the truest sense of the word. 
In the block universe, our sense of the passage of time is rather comparable to the visions of a schizophrenic, that is, something that exists only within us and does not exist in the real world. Contemporary philosopher Craig Callender writes, the equations of physics do not explain what events are happening right now. They are like a map that doesn't have a circle on it that says you are here. There is no present moment in time, and therefore, no flow of time. And solving this riddle, the riddle of uniting human perception with the laws of nature, is an extremely difficult task that lies at the intersection of physics, neurobiology, psychology, and philosophy. Is science unable to comprehend the fundamental property of time? which the human mind perceives as naturally as the lungs absorb air? Or does the human mind artificially impart to time some property of its own manufacture, not manifest in the laws of physics? If you ask me this question, during working hours, I would lean toward the second version. But in the evening, when critical thought slips into the humdrum of everyday life, it's hard to disagree with the first view. Brian Greene, theoretical physicist, one of the best known string theorists, we said at the beginning of the video that the structure of the universe has imprinted on the design of the human brain, and the brain does indeed, as we saw in the analogy from relativity theory, make time spatial. But Dean Bonomano suggests that we should also consider the reverse. He asks, are we not inclined to one interpretation or another of the laws of physics for the reason that the brain interprets time in a certain way? That is, the laws of physics and the human brain are not independent of each other. It is not just that what happens in the brain is based on the laws of physics, but that our interpretation of physical laws is related to the functioning of the brain. Isn't the way our also spatially oriented brains are organized related to the fact that when we look at equations, we see them as the block universe? How unbiased is the brain in its interpretations? Or else we again have a situation where the person himself does not fit into the physical picture of the world that he has created. Meanwhile, you must realize one very important thing. From the laws of physics, there is no unambiguous conclusion that we live in a four-dimensional block universe. The idea of a block universe is certainly the most satisfactory interpretation, an attempt to explain what the equations of special and general relativity say. It is a generally accepted interpretation that many respected scientists accept. But it is still only an interpretation. There is still an ongoing struggle in physics to create a coherent theory that can explain the nature of time. And, as it should be in science, there is no consensus among those scientists who adhere to the concept of a block universe. Some are making their own attempts to explain the sense of the passage of time. The same David Dutch, in his book, speaking about our sense of time in the block, Multiverse, writes, Objectively, the present does not exist. We do not feel time flowing or passing. We feel the differences between our present sensations and our present memories of past sensations. Or here, the already mentioned Brian Greene also gives his commentary that tries to reconcile the sense of time flow with the block universe. Every moment in space-time, every slice of time, is like a frame of a movie. And every such moment is a present moment for you. And you are experiencing in it your sensations of that moment. And it will always be so. Moreover, in each individual slice of time, your thoughts and memories are rich enough to give us a sense of the constant flow of time. This feeling, this sense of the flow of time, does not require that previous moments be consistently highlighted. You are the only one to judge, but all of this doesn't really sound like an answer, but rather an attempt to evade it. Maybe the struggle of different ideas will one day help us better understand the nature of time, or maybe it's even more unexplored than we currently realize. To quote New York University professor and one of the world's leading philosophers of physics, Tim Maudlin, the world is not just a set of separately existing localized objects connected externally only by space and time. Something deeper, more mysterious, binds together the fabric of the universe. We've only just reached the point in the development of physics where we can begin to speculate about what that might be. Thank you all very much for watching.